Okay, very good morning. It is Thursday 24th of October. I uh, hope you're well. Uh, going to cover this morning a look ahead for uh, kind of two big events coming up. One being momentarily, which is the European PMI data. So while, while I am delivering this briefing, you are likely to see some movement in European assets. So I'll try and do my best to keep an eye on the, uh, the news scroll whilst I'm doing this session. Um, because we've got the various European manufacturing and service PMIs. These are the flash readings for October. So just be mindful that these more than likely will move the Euro European related assets. You've got the first number uh, of real significance coming out from uh, France at 8.15. So just under 10 minutes time. And then the German figures are going to hit at 8.30 for the Eurozone kind of conclusion at nine o'clock. So first things first, just be mindful of that um, over while I'm talking in the next few minutes. Uh, secondly, obviously it's the ECB press conference, so we'll have a quick look at what we're expecting, uh, if anything, from Mario Draghi and what the eventual outcome could be. But first of all, just having a look at the charts this morning at the open, uh, relatively quiet, a little bit of an uptick in uh, the British pound. If you've been listening to the squawk, a couple of murmurs on Twitter from different journalists about the idea of Labour warming to a general election. Um, otherwise, I'll go through uh, the headlines on Brexit in a moment. Other indices in, in the equity market, relatively flat. Uh, overall positive close on Wall Street last night. The S&P finishing up about um, eight points and still holding above that 3,000 level. Uh, European indices following suit, relatively positive this morning. DAX just off session highs up 62 already out of the gate through the cash open. Daimler shares uh, after their earnings this morning up about 4.5%. Just very quickly, in terms of the other European movers, ST Micra in France up about 4 Daimler up, as I said, 4.5%. Astra, Zeneca and RBS. Astra up 1.5%, RBS down 3 uh, are some of the notable market movers uh, on the European UK earnings side. Uh, otherwise, fixed income and gold pretty flat so if you were looking at those to get a bit of an idea from a risk perspective not too many cues coming there as we await this major data and then their major central bank event so before i get into to brexit and the ecb just very quickly uh, to update you we did have some large cap earnings of course last night uh, microsoft shares not really seeing a great deal of movement uh, sales and profit topped estimates on cloud and azure slows uh, so nothing really too surprising. Uh, sales and profit got a boost from demand for their Azure cloud computing programs and internet-based versions of Office productivity software, lifting results above analyst expectations. But uh, I was looking at some of the research yesterday for two years straight. So eight now make it nine consecutive earnings reports in Microsoft. I think they've exceeded expectations on things like uh, EPS and, and, and revenue. So it's unsurprising, hence the turnaround that that company has really seen in recent years, to put it right at the top of the pile of the biggest companies uh, in the world. Uh, the other one was that kind of smaller but more sentiment-related company, which has helped lift uh, possibly a little bit of just sentiment into the close yesterday and, uh, and kept things buoyant overnight in the Asia-Pacific session. That was Tesla. Uh, Tesla packs profit report with positivity as Musk breaks the mold. Obviously, what they mean by Musk breaks the mold, we're so used to him uh, putting out such lofty expectations and what the firm can achieve, and he never really lives up to the hype. Well, he did, and actually, he absolutely smashed the estimates on the street. I can't remember the figures precisely, but I think their earnings per share was supposed to be a negative and actually came out something like just shy of $2. Yeah, dollar eighty-six in Q3. So it was wildly above expectations. Uh, earnings margins uh, exceeded those expectations. Their revenues did drop, but nonetheless, their shares did hit or rise as much as 21% last night. Uh, that sounds a, a huge pop in their price, but don't forget that it's not abnormal to see company like Tesla, their volatility generally on their earnings reports does tend to be you know, far in excess of someone that you would likely see from a more kind of matured company like and someone of the size of Microsoft, of course. Uh, but overall, I think just to quickly summarize on the US earnings so far, uh, actually, I think, you know, going into this earnings season, people were so downbeat. You know, if you think about Xing out the Brexit shenanigans that are going on, um, the economic environment has been souring and you'd think from a 
corporate profitability point of view, both now and forward looking, that people would be pessimistic. And actually, I'd say on the balance, that hasn't happened. Uh, in fact, I think 80% of all S&P companies that have reported have exceeded expectations on their earnings per share. So uh, that is a little bit better than the, the kind of five year average. And I think goes against the grain a little bit of perhaps where people were positioning for about two weeks ago before really earnings season kicked off. So it does give some reasoning for the underlying support we've had in, in US indices overall and, uh, and the reasoning why then the S&P for the moment remains above that, that 3000 level. Okay, jumping straight into Brexit then. Here's the man of the moment, of course, uh, Boris Johnson. And what is the latest that we're looking at here? So French, uh, it's all about the, well, before I get into what France want, what Macron's been saying, uh, the EU is keeping Boris Johnson waiting over the length of a Brexit extension. And really, this is the next pivotal point of where we go uh, in this Brexit saga between whether or not he looks to, that's Boris, uh, persevere with trying to get his deal over the line in time or in the near future or do they grant a longer extension which then open up the, the higher likelihood of having a general election uh, so what's the current status on the European side before they really give a formal uh, response to what they're going to do uh, the French are pushing for a tighter deadline of November 15th so essentially just giving an extra two week leeway to the current existing end date of October 31st, of course. A um, couple of things to be aware of with that. A short extension to November 15th could help the Prime Minister, if you think about it, to concentrate the minds in Parliament as MPs concerned about a no-deal departure rally to try and pass a deal. So essentially, you're just kicking the can down the road by another two weeks. And look, let's get this deal over the line. And that meaningful vote, of course, was the first of any meaningful vote to pass given the three uh, failed attempts from Theresa May and that the arithmetic would say there is some appetite to get that passed. It's a withdrawal bill that struggled the more legislative section of the, uh, of the proceedings. Uh, a couple of things though, um, with France and Macron pushing for this tighter deadline, he is essentially going against what other European leaders are, uh, are more inclined to do, which is give a more lengthy extension um, the reason why people are a little bit more, from a market's point of view, more aligned with the fact that Europe are likely to grant a three-month extension, what originally is what the UK has asked for, to going back to the end of January, uh, is because Macron's made these kind of calls before in previous deadlines that we've had, but he's never really followed through with it uh, in the end. And so I can kind of understand this as just European political posturing they just want to make sure that the UK is, uh, is sure that Europe's not just bending over, uh, adhering to the UK uh, request. So I don't think it's any more than that. I do think at the moment Europe will be open to this probably flex tension uh, approach by having that deadline in Jan, but the ability to execute it if he can get the deal ratified beforehand to exit Europe. A few other things then to be aware of with the Brexit side. Uh, if the EU does grant an extension to the end of January 31st, which is looking, I think, still the most probable, the UK will likely be headed for an early general election. Now, on that front, do be aware that Parliament has twice rejected attempts by Johnson to force a national ballot, but Corbyn has repeatedly said that once a no-deal Brexit on October 31st has been ruled out, Labour will be ready to let him dissolve Parliament. So this is really what we're looking at on the Brexit side. Um, before I continue on that, we've just had the French PMI data come out. Uh, the manufacturing figure, 50 spot 5, higher than expected by 0.3. The services figure, 52.9. Expectations were for 51.6, so particularly strong on the service sector and the PMI. If you remember, France, when we had the, uh, the yellow jacket protests, that really hit the service area of the French economy and has dragged them down in terms of their economic kind of prospects. So to see that bouncing back quite sharply is, is quite a distinct positive when otherwise we've had quite negative readings in terms of the, the overall Eurozone economy of late. So just quickly, just to break from the Brexit talk, the Euro seeing an immediate spike on the back of that, just taken out that kind of double top of last night US closed an overnight Asia Pacific test and just powered through the R1 just given the magnitude of that service beat so 
Uh, upside levels, we're just having a quick run up here on the fast money move for a retest uh, on that high that we printed uh, back on the 22nd, you can see here. And you've got some of that range high to keep an eye on just a few uh, pips above. So yeah, solid service number from the French uh, and the euro loving life at the moment on the back of that, just given how depressed generally European data has been of late and how dovish then the ECB have been sounding of late as well. Uh, gold, consequently, and T-notes also getting a bit of a knee-jerk reaction on that data. Uh, again, as I said, it does go against the grain of, of European uh, just general sentiment economically of late, but importantly for France, that service number uh, has been depressed over the last kind of 12 months. And so a, a bounce back would be a, a sharp relief for that particular country. All right, I'll keep an eye on the, don't forget we've got the German number as well at half past, so I'll try and rattle through this, this briefing as quickly as possible. Uh, but yeah, just going back to the point on Brexit, a few summary points to think about. Um, Parliament has twice rejected attempts by Johnson to force a national ballot. Remember, he's pushed for an election before, but of course he needs two-thirds majority of Parliament to back him, and they never have. But Corbyn has repeatedly said that once a no-deal Brexit on October 31st has been ruled out, Labour would be ready to let him dissolve Parliament, that being then the backing of, a, of a pursuing a general election. So really, we've had a few tweets this morning from other Labour officials, but not Corbyn. What we're looking for is what does Corbyn say? Does he really follow that up or not? Does he commit to an election if indeed Europe do grant a lengthy three-month extension? If that does happen, I'd say for me, that does play into the hands of, uh, of Boris to some extent. But there's a couple things here to think about. Uh, in a meeting last night, uh, and this is what I'm looking at here, or before I do, uh, Johnson told Commons um, yesterday, firstly, that if he was forced into a lengthy extension on Brexit deadline, he'd seek to call an early general election. The Times newspaper said yesterday he could be ready to do that on either Thursday today or Monday next week, just in terms of timing. The other thing to be aware of, though, is, um, as I said, he needs two-thirds majority of Parliament to back him to, to go down an election route. And last night, apparently, there was a meeting held by what's called the One Nation Group. Um, so if you think of the Conservative Party, there's the more kind of Eurosceptic ERG. On the flip side, there's more moderate Tory MPs known as the One Nation they're a group of around 70 plus MPs in the Conservative Party and they unanimously agreed it would be opposed to an election before Brexit was resolved. Uh, so it's not quite slam dunk as yet. Um, several Conservative MPs are concerned about the prospects of holding an election in the second week of December when the winter weather could hinder campaigning and activist support. And also, on the flip side, there is the threat posed, of course, by the Brexit party and remain supporting Liberal Democrats, especially if Brexit is unresolved. So some say that the longer it's drawn out, and the reason why Corbyn might be open to a, an election if the deadline then is Jan 31st, is the idea that that gives more strength to the Lib Dem or Brexit party's um, idea that basically Boris has failed. And so therefore, a more protracted, drawn out, lengthy um, delay would play into their favour, hence the reason why Boris probably likes the Macron solution of November 15th, because uh, it continues to fit more within his more aggressive timelines to deliver Brexit. Okay, that's it for Brexit. I'm not going to go any further than that. So really, the balance of power from a headline moving perspective today is going to be on, does Corbyn back a, uh, a general election, but that firstly is contingent on what the Europe say and what's the confirmation on the details of the length of the extension that they allow. Okay, quickly, um, Draghi and the Eurozone and the ECB today, 12.45 for the rate decision and statement and then press conference, of course, Draghi's final one's going to happen at 1.30. Uh, really, this shouldn't take me too long because the overall take-home summary here is that I'm not expecting a great deal, to be honest. Um, it would be, I think, uh, unusual to see Draghi, who's you know particularly well skilled and rehearsed now in these events, to really disrupt things um, for Christine Lagarde, who will obviously take over uh, as he departs this month. And so I'm basically expecting a copy-paste repeat of basically what we had in September. 
Um, the reason why then, I mean, that definitely leads down the more dovish kind of sounding um, ECB. Uh, if you look at this, this graphic here, this is looking at the three uh, ECB presidents we've had since the inception of the European Central Bank back in 1999. And you can see, actually, Draghi has had a bit of a tough time. Uh, the ECB's target, obviously, is 2% on inflation. And you can see uh, Dusenberg and Trichet did a pretty good job at keeping inflation, although Trichet obviously had wild swings through the financial crisis. But on average, keeping it at 2%, whereas um, Draghi's really struggled to get it up there, and it's always remained just above that 1% level. And at the moment, inflation is tracking at 0.8%, so wildly away from target, hence the reason why the ECB are recommencing their quantitative easing program, counteracting the weakness in the economy, but also to try and fire up inflation before uh, waning demand, if that continues, becomes an ever more increasing problem. So looking to get a little bit ahead of the curve in that respect. Um, Euro area household sentiment obviously has been decreasing. We've broken recent trends uh, and getting down to depressed levels that we were seeing amid that really aggressive sell-off we had in Q4 when we had the global stock market route, of course with the escalation of the trade war and, and policy tightening that was happening. And that has altered the timeline a little bit about what and when are the ECB going to act. So obviously the recommencement of QE starts, and that has created, as we know, large division within the, Euro uh, the governing council about whether that was the right move to make has been very disgruntled from the, the kind of Germans and the more northern countries in that respect, uh, that that was the right decision. Uh, and then the cut to the deposit rate has been pushed back a little bit, but still priced in for the summer of next year uh, at this present point in time. The, the thing you're probably likely to hear from Draghi, uh, this is a, a, a kind of graphic talking about fiscal firepower. Obviously, Germany, uh, which typically runs a surplus, very unusual comparative to most other Eurozone nations, does have uh, the lowest debt burden, so consequently some fiscal ammunition to act and given the size of the economy that could be a potent force um, but would they want to do that probably not at this point but you're likely to hear Mario Draghi as he has done recently in the press conference kind of bang the drum that uh, governments need to take more fiscal action in order to supplement then what has been uh, kind of a relatively low ammunition box on the monetary policy side okay that's it though, I'm going to cover on that. Obviously we'll talk about the ECB much later this afternoon when the event happens. But net summary, I wouldn't be looking for um, fantastic moves actually on the back of this. I think if he does it as he has become well known for and manages the event well, I'd be looking for fairly little disruption to market prices. And as you can see, I think these PMIs are actually more interesting. And we've got the German one coming up, so just be mindful of that. If that German one comes out strong as well, you could see another little injection in the euro and a bit more downside pressure in gold that you've already seen, uh, which is residing at its S1 in the, the futures at the moment. Um, other than uh, the ECB and the PMIs, you do have US durable goods coming out this afternoon. You get US jobless claims as usual on a Thursday, and you get the US um, services manufacturing flash PMIs as well at 245. From an earnings perspective, this is just a quick recap. Pre-market, you've got the likes of 3M. Uh, it's probably the largest company uh, coming out before the opening bell. And then Amazon, aftermarket, Visa, Intel, probably the names to look out for. Okay, on that front, I'm going to hand you over to Sam. Um, I will post the German numbers as they come out in four minutes' time into the chat. So Sam's aware and he can look at the charts and update his, his technical look while he's doing it. Okay, thanks, guys. Have a good day. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, we'll start off with Euro. I think no harm in, in doing that while we're just waiting for the, the German numbers to come out. And as, uh, as Ant said, those French beating expectations across the board and we, we pushed higher. I um, was just looking, what I've written down, and this was before it was coming out, uh, just at the, the low of yesterday really being the bottom part of that range. And you know, we've got the ECB, and uh, I think it would be a safe bet to say whatever the spike is, it's going to do the opposite and then finish the day exactly where it is. Um, but worth keeping an eye for later on on, on this this low um, from yesterday. 
uh, just to confirm in the bottom part of this perhaps mini range that we are now in the low of the afternoon of the 17th as well break below there then I would say the next sort of level to keep an eye on would be the high of the 16th uh, we're now back above there um, I had marks up as well R1 uh, and the high from the 17th obviously breaking through that now even though we were a bit choppy on on uh, Tuesday session uh, be keeping a, a watch if we were to come back to, to retest that area and some of these highs as well as a potential point for, for the buyers to, to want to come back in again uh, and whether that be um, possible if the German and European numbers are you know also a lot better uh, that could be a, a move that doesn't take place until Draghi comes on and then obviously things would, would have changed a, mm -hmm. a fair bit as well so ECB later on uh, will probably mean just uh, tidying up the, the technical analysis part of this uh, later on as well. But we're just uh, trading at the moment on uh, the highs that we had back on uh, the 22nd, so on Tuesday and also uh, Monday evening uh, as well. So a bit of resistance you'd expect around here <coughs> on a retracement. Uh, I'd, well, obviously you've got the data out in three minutes, two minutes, so <coughs> probably best to wait for that. But I do like the idea if we were to come back towards the previous highs. Uh, as a nice level of support or profit take of course if the German numbers are worse uh, than expected the low that we just talked about in the euro same as the pound really the low we hit yesterday was also the low that we had back on the uh, the 18th uh, and that's guided uh, this price higher for the pound we finally got above uh, it's <coughs> higher the day yesterday evening uh, I've got a, uh, a nice Facebook message from someone saying uh, it's above my level so uh, shout out Fez for, for letting me know so I can get in on that. And uh, yeah, we, we have pushed higher. I mean, we're just coming under a bit of pressure uh, off this R1, but you know, nothing doing really. Uh, I don't think there's been any comments out or anything more, just a bit of profit taking above that. And we're now pretty much on what was the high of last night and then the Asian session morning as well. So 129.44 is a, a good enough level, I think, to the whole price. Uh, for, for now above where we're trading uh, as well it's probably worth uh, keeping an eye on from the highs that we've had from the 21st just in case we you know we come up and hit that 130 which is also you know some previous highs in the mix there as well and then also from the lows just potential for you know just getting squeezed in from both directions only got the two tests each way so I'll be more looking to see what happens uh, on the potential third test of these levels but quiet day yesterday quiet day yesterday and uh, I think bigger things to come let's have a quick look over at the yen obviously got 30, 20 seconds until that uh, European number comes out so keep an eye uh, on that we can just see uh, risk assets pushing higher this morning and therefore your safe havens coming under a bit of pressure I want to keep an eye what happens on this trend of the last few trading sessions we're now closed below it or about to close at the hour below so therefore looking potentially at, at that as a resistance point to, to come in. we we'll have a quick look over the reaction here in the euro is the uh, pretty much inline manufacturing lower well just the word lower there you can see is what that's done to euro and back down to that R1 uh, where of course you would expect a little bit of profit taking to, to take place so those German numbers uh, not taking the, the cue from the French ones uh, and actually coming all worse than expected on uh, investing.com 48.6, 41.9 and 51.2 uh, so yeah, not, not looking good and actually you would say now that, that uh, support level is unlikely to hold and therefore as well <coughs> the yen on that trend line is likely actually to break above regardless where it closed now so almost the opposite of those French and the gold which came down you've got to imagine is pushing higher which it is and that what would have been a nice place to have got short on yesterday afternoons or yesterday mornings low and then this was also the low from the Asian session now doesn't look as attractive as before and in fact you maybe want to just hold off uh, that short but as a resistance level as a profit target obviously that gold does look good also on gold while we're we're here, you can see the, the trend lines from the 15th starting through. We just couldn't get a break, a confirmed break above it. Got choppy towards the end, but we closed the day below. Uh, so I would still say that's of some importance. 1500 uh, didn't quite get tested as well. So that whole area above uh, where we're trading on those uh, highs that we've been getting squeezed in from has held. Uh, but overall gold, and I keep saying this in overall direction, 
I'm not too sure, uh, to be honest, about where it is going to go, and probably just best to wait for a confirmed break uh, either way. Uh, obviously, by the time it closes that day, it could well, of course, be gone. So no harm in, in sort of looking to see if there is a, a catalyst to get aggressive on the break either way. S&P, as uh, we saw early trade, the DAX pushing higher, dragging S&P uh, as well, but now the German number's not so good, so we've got to come down and, and reverse a bit of that, and, and that's what's happened here. 3,000 uh, and the pivot worth uh, keeping an eye on as there was you know, decent enough price action around that area. Uh, yesterday's high, almost this morning's low, around six, so that's another point to, to have marked up. And also the double top that we had from the 22nd, that trend line just before R1. So if you are looking to get long later on, I would be looking to take profit definitely before we get to that resistance point uh, as well. Having a look longer term, you can see obviously so close really to, to testing these all-time highs again, which is quite incredible really. But uh, again, longer term, up around, coming in around 30, 20 would be another point of interest that I would have up, which is only 11 points uh, to the upside. So a day like yesterday, we would get that test uh, as well. Quick look over at oil to finish things up. Decent push yesterday on the uh, the shock draw, should we say, of the, the DOE in comparison to the API. Good push higher, uh, really that, that coming in and uh, getting us up to 56 and, and closing the day quite nicely. You can see above what, what, what was a, a good resistance point at 55 that we were talking about. So that's still an area I'd be looking at for potential points to, to get long on that possible retracement. Uh, it seems like the Bulls have won that thanks to that DOE. Above where we're trading, next sort of key level uh, market-wise of, of really important highs, just a bit above where we're trading here at 56, 60, uh, basically a dollar above. So we're now perhaps a bit mid-range for the next decent opportunity. But you can see once we broke that 55, uh, a good battle around there, in which the Bulls then won. Also the R1 from yesterday uh, as well. Any questions as usual, please uh, do let us know. Uh, you've got 25 minutes on the dot pretty much until uh, the European numbers come out and of course Draghi then 12.45 uh, release and 1.30 presser <laughs> will be taking over uh, a lot of uh, people's attention. Hope you all have a, a good trading day and we'll catch you later on.